Yes, yes, yes. Uh, good evening, madam. I'll be presenting a case of a 20, 29-year-old male uh, who was initially uh, currently working in a welding metal assembly industry since one year, but previously was working in pesticide factory using bare hands and mixing chemicals for almost four years and was also working in a plastic molding industry for the next two years. He is hailing from Bangalore. The informant is himself and the history is reliable. He is a right-handed individual. He came with the chief complaints of pins and needle sensations in all four limbs since one year and a weakness in all four limbs since one year, which has been increased since the past one and a half months. Coming to the present history of presenting illness, patient was apparently all right one year ago, performing his routine daily activities when he initially noticed pins and needle sensation, which was acute in onset, initially was noticed in the ventral surface of the, both the palms, simultaneously, which was symmetrical at onset, and progressed uh, up to a few centimeters beyond the wrist uh, over a period of two to three days. During this period of onset of parasthesias, so it started in the upper limb. Huh? It started in the upper limb. Initially, in the palm or surface of both um, the palms, it started. Mm. Progressed uh, two centimeter beyond uh, above the wrist. Two days later, he developed weakness of all four limbs. The weakness started initially in the upper limb, which was sudden in onset and progressive. Initially, it started in the digits, such that he noticed difficulty in mixing of food and buttoning and unbuttoning shirt. Following which, he stopped wearing the shirts, and then the weakness progressed over one day to involve the proximal muscle, such that. He was unable to comb the hair and also wear shirts and t-shirts and required support in doing so. Two days after the onset of the weakness of the uh, limbs, upper limbs, he started developing lower limb weakness. So the lower limb weakness started uh, in such that he had difficulty in uh, getting up from squatting position and during which he used his arms to rest on the thigh and uh, the attenders had noticed that his hip used to go up whenever he used to uh, um, uh, get up from squatting position, following which he also had difficulty in uh, climbing up the stairs. One day later, there was also history of buckling that the patient complained of. However, he denied any history of difficulty in navigating the footwear, uh, navigating his feet through the footwear, gripping of the footwear, loss of sensation over the footwear, and there is no history of difficulty in rolling in the side to side or any drooping of, uh, drooping of it during that episode. At that episode, there was no history of any cranial nerve involvement or autonomic involvement at that uh, point of time. There is no history of any lermite phenomenon, wash basin phenomenon, any history of false root pains or girdle like sensation. There is no history of any breathing difficulty the patient noticed. Uh, and the patient was bedridden by the time he was uh, taken to the local hospital. So there they had taken him to a local Ayurvedic clinic where uh, they had given. Two months. Is it bedridden by two months? Madam, uh, by one, by almost uh, two weeks, he became bedridden. Okay. So for that, he was taken to Ayurvedic doctor, and there they were given some uh, syrup and some uh, powders. Along with that, he was also given uh, injection, multivitamin injections. Uh, over the past, for the next almost one to one and a half month, that weakness uh, remained static after that. And the patient slowly uh, regained the power in the hand, in the lower limb and upper limb. Initially, there was a lower limb improvement followed by the upper limb improvement. So he took almost two to two and a half months to recover. After the recovery, he was able to do his normal daily activities. Um, he was able to use the, both the proximal and distal muscles in the both the upper and lower limb. Uh, after that, they had taken him to a local uh, neurologist also. Uh, because they are told that uh, some paralysis was there by the Ayurvedic physician had told them there is paralysis and there they had done an MRI uh, of the brain and the spine and uh, they said NCS, probably NCS was done but that available, that uh, reports are not available uh, with the sad present. Uh, he had completely recovered. Um, now the patient came now with complaints of difficulty in gripping objects since one month. This uh, difficulty so in what was the gap between the first recovery and this one? Uh, almost uh, uh, seven months, madam. Seven months. Okay. 
Seven months normal. Seven months he was normal. normal. Now since one month he has developed uh, um, difficulty or weakness in gripping objects. Uh, it was insistent in onset and gradually progressive. Initially involving distal muscles with the difficulty in mixing food, buttoning and unbuttoning clothes. Progress is that he was unable to bath independently. And uh, over the next 10 to 15 days he also had difficulty in uh, reaching overhead objects. He also noticed twitching in the hands and chin this time. And uh, over the past one to one and a half month, uh, he's also noticed the patient and the attenders have noticed thinning in both the uh, uh, hands, predominantly in the uh, wrist. And in the palmar surface, there is thinning of the uh, muscles that they have noticed. And also difficulty in getting up from squatting position since 15 days. With history of uh, hip up sign being positive and difficulty in uh, climbing upstairs. There's no history of any uh, cranial nerve involvement, um, neck or trunkal weakness. There's no history of uh, systemic inflammation like fever, weight loss, or uh, uh, loss in appetite. There is no history of uh, joint pain, skin lesions, skin lesions, photosensitivity, or Reynolds phenomenon. There's no history of any abdominal pain or uh, reddish urine that the patient noticed. There's no history of giddiness or trauma that the patient had. Um, a family history is born of a non-consanguineous marriage. No similar complaints in the family. He has an uh, elder brother and he, both are doing well. Personal history, no known comorbidities. Sleep is adequate. Diet is mixed. Bowel and bladder is regular. He denies any high-risk habits. A 29-year-old gentle, right-handed gentleman, previously working in a pesticide manufacturing industry, uh, now presented with painless paresthesia in bilateral upper limbs since one year with weakness in all four limbs. Initially began distally in the upper limb, progressed proximally uh, with no cranial nerve, bowel, bladder involvement. And uh, there is recurrence of weakness uh, since the past 30 days with predominant uh, distal to proximal uh, 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 progression with associated wasting and uh, twitching in the chin as well as the uh, twitching in the chin. So and the, the second episode is uh, distal to proximal. In the distal to proximal. Loyal, the loyal limb. Lower limb is proximal only, madam. No distal involvement. Okay. So localization, we are thinking in terms of lower motor neuron. Uh, most probably peripheral nerve or a root. So initial episode uh, possibly was a demyelination followed by a uh, no progressive axonal injury. Other differential because he was working in a pesticide factory, we are also thinking of toxin mediated. Other thing is metabolic and uh, lower down, we are thinking infective etiologies. Okay, so we will analyze the history. This also uh, interesting patient only. So it was very rapid. In the initial thing was also to peak is only two weeks. Yes, madam. And uh, what you found uh, is a sensory symptom in the both upper limbs, which started symmetrically. No? symmetrically. Yes, so you did not. Uh, so something which starts in the upper limb and which is of uh, probably lower motor. It's a nerve anyway, because it is sensation. And uh, because there was the thinning and the wasting, all those things noticed, it can be lower motor neuron. There was no stiffness or anything. Yes. So uh, lower motor neuron starting in the upper limb. Yes, so uh, commonest, uh, so that is the very interesting thing. So commonest thing are radiculopathies. Cervical radiculopathies, disc disease, or uh, tuberculosis or osteomyelitis, metastasis like that. So one thing, uh, so you see the radiculopathy, that is the first question. But very, very unlikely because it was not having the root pain, it was not having the radicular fashion and it was very symmetrical and it involved more than one roots. Mm -hmm. So upper limb, if you take uh, roots, distal symmetrical will be uh, not one root. Uh, because outer part is C6, middle is C7, and medial part is C8. Right. So, and no root pain, nothing like a root at all. So, it is a symmetrical, uh, sensory dominant element syndrome, which started very fast in the upper limb. Right. As you rightly said, when there is a sensory involvement, there is no differential diagnosis. It cannot be muscle or anterior muscle or anything like that. It has to be in the nerve. So what is the special thing about the nerve is non-length dependent. So it's a neuropathy. It is not a radiculopathy. It is not a mononeuritis. If it is a radiculopathy, radicular pain will be there. Asymmetry will be there. 
and a radical pattern of weakness will be there. If it is a mononeuritis, again, whether it is an ulnar nerve or a radial nerve or a median nerve pattern, it will be patchy asymmetrical. So it cannot be mononeuritis. So upper limb onset, is it a radical, is it a mononeuritis or is it a peripheral neuropathy? Because upper limb onset peripheral neuropathies are relatively less common. More common is mononeuritis, Hansel's disease or entrapment neuropathies like carpal tunnel syndrome, pressure palsy of the radial nerve, or ulnar nerve compression following fractures, tardive ulnar palsy. So non-length dependent neuropathies are generally mononeuritis when they start in the upper limb. So it is not, even though that is the commonest, this clinical picture, so what strikes us is the upper limb onset. Uh, it's a definitely a nerve, not muscle or anything. It is not a root. It is not a common mononeuritis multiplex. Then you will expect an individual nerve pattern coming patchy, picking up one by one. It did not happen like that. Instead, it picked up both distal sensory symmetrically. So you have to think it is a peripheral neuropathy only. It is not respecting mononeuritis pattern. It is not respecting a radicular pattern to take a thing which starts in the upper limb. It's a peripheral neuropathy which is starting in the uh, upper limb. So am I dealing with a non-short axonal neuropathy or a neuronopathy? You have got neuronopathies. So neuronopathies are non-length dependent. Or short axonal neuropathies are non-length dependent. Short axonal neuropathy specifically pick up the short axons like most of the uh, axoplasmic flow affecting neuropathies involve the long nerves, length dependent, whereas short axonal neuropathies prefer the nerves which are short axons. So is it a short axonal neuropathy or is it a neuronopathy? These are the two questions. So it is not, so four things we consider. I am telling because the young boys or girls will be there, I am repeating. Because it is very unusual for a neuropathy to start in the upper lip. If it starts in the upper limb, always think, is it a radiculopathy? Is it a mononeuritis multiplex? And if these are the two common things, and if you feel it is not a ulnar nerve, median nerve, radial nerve pattern, it is not a root pattern. How we differentiate by as I always, always tell, sensory motor reflex. So sensory will have positive, negative, which will have the typical radicular pattern, shock-like pain, precipitating factor, relieving factor, radicular distribution, and reflexes served by those roots. If it is a nerve, it will be tinnel sign. You will not have the radicular pain. You will have tenderness over the uh, uh, exposed parts of the nerve and the nerve pattern of motor and sensory. So the and it will be always patchy and picked one by one, not symmetrically and takes place over a longer period of time. So these two common things we start in the upper limb are not likely. Then the third question, is it a short axonal neuropathy or a neuronopathy. Neuronopathies are typically non-length dependent. So what are short axonal neuropathies? You have got organophosphorus. You said a lot of uh, uh, drugs exposure. So OP compound. OP compound is one situation where you get a short axonal neuropathy. Second, you get it in tangious disease, amyloid. Porphyria. So these are some conditions, typical conditions, amyloidosis, tangious disease, porphyria, and OP compound poisoning, where you get a short axon preferring neuropathies. They, they prefer the short axons and they prefer the small fibers. So it will be uh, pain and temperature fibers more involved and it will be upper limb onset, symmetrical peripheral neuropathy. So you see it one among all these. So uh, we will keep that query there, but uh, if it is a OP compound poisoning, evolving chronic OP compound poisoning or a acute OP compound poisoning. So chronic OP compound poisoning will not evolve in such onset to peak is only two weeks. So chronic OP compound poisoning will evolve over a very long period, long exposure, long period. Sensory dominance sparing the autonomy. That is the picture of long duration OP compound exposure. 
where a short duration op compound exposure will have all the classical features <coughs> which all of you will be very familiar with excessive secretion salivation twitching and uh, while recovering patient will get uh, uh, intermediary syndromes or delayed neuropathy which can start with the upper limb but that picture is not there so clinically it is less likely even though this patient is exposed to toxins it is less likely <laughs> amyloid porphyria tangiers of course the core is there look for the orange tonsils look at the blood for the lipoproteins and uh, you can uh, palpate the nerves and see whether other features of amyloid is there and history of porphyria like uh, psychosis abdominal pain seizures in the past any drug related worsening all those questions you can ask but theoretically it appears uh, less likely because uh, and, um, uh, all this you might have seen they do most important thing i have told you about the 3 6 10 pattern of approach to peripheral nerve of which the most important uh, clue is the temporal profile that is the onset to peak the onset to peak is so different in these conditions or op i said it will be long tangiers will be long and uh, amyloid will be long and porphyria can be hyperacute when it is hyperacute it is more motor dominant than sensory and other features may be there so it is not fitting into any of the classical presentation of the well described conditions but a typical we do not know is not fitting into the classical uh, non linear dependent neuropathy so those become less in the differential diagnosis then is it a neuronopathy so neuronopathy is a typically you know conditions like jogren's disease okay. vasculitis sometimes uh, viral neuronopathy paraneoplastic neuronopathy some subacute viral infections paraneoplastic syndromes jogren and other kind of vasculitis can present with neuronopathy so what is the typical feature of a neuronopathy one non length dependent so neuronopathy is are non length dependent that we are having in this patient second they are sensory dominant that also we are having in this patient third you may have cranial nerve involvement you may have autonomic features and uh, your patchy involvement can happen and when you do electrophysiology it will be falsely normal so these are the uh, neuronopathy of which you have two important features non length dependent sensory dominant whether there is a dry mouth whether there is a facial sensory features whether there is a uh, drying of the tear secretion it may be uh, present in the symptom or you may have to elicit it so i will feel that now think, considering all the things uh, which start in the upper limb the first in the list will be neuronopathy so apparently it looks like a neuronopathy because of the symmetrical onset short duration sensory dominant other features we will elicit and see so the most closer differential diagnosis for me when i if i have seen this patient at the time of the upper limb onset it will be neuronopathy second so now so we will keep it like that non length dependent sensory dominant upper limb onset uh, symptom started in this young man other features we will do when we examine he may not be able to tell you i had dry mouth dry eyes poor person working in all those odd situations they may not have time to sense it so we'll keep it like that in the lower limb you said that his problem started proximally so he noticed hip up so when you notice hip up it means it is the gluteus maximus got involved first and then you to, uh, no, told that he had climbing difficulty if it was an alternate climbing and he has to put one leg on the other then it will be uh, iliopsoas or if it is a hip elevation it will be still gluteal only and later he had a buckling that is quadriceps so hip extension will be is the first thing as from the history that is a hip up so uh, putting the same nerve in the lower limb uh, if you put the proximal it is radical so uh, you see uh, i am sure you know that neuropathy start literally mononeuritis can be patchy whereas radicals are proximal so why radicals are proximal usually radiculopathy is 
affect the myelin acute radiculopathies affect the myelin and where is the myelin more maximum will be the symptomatic thing and the myelin is more in the short roots so it starts proximal and then goes distal so apparently hip extension is s1 and uh, knee extension is l3 adduction and abduction may be involved we don't know adduction is l2 abduction is l5 hip flexion is l1 so apparently l1 l2 and uh, l3 l2 we don't know we are not having the history adduction we are to examine so l1 l3 s1 that will be the radicular supply and uh, in this group you do not expect a root pains because only if it is a compressive one you will expect radiculopathy will have a root pain so proximal onset uh, nerve disease is a radiculopathy unless we want to think that there is a muscle and the nerve combination or there muscle and the nerve combination neuromyositis we call but uh, why i am clinically not suspecting that one it is very rapid and there was no pain in the muscles so neuromyositis is myositis of the muscle and neuropathy of the nerve it is seen in diabetes it is in immunological conditions paraneoplastic conditions but the muscle is suspected by the severe pain myositis producing a muscle pain that kind of pain this patient did not tell and it evolved as a proximal weakness so i think the possibility will be radiculopathy of course we will not rule out muscle involvement as the cause for the proximal then he developed a uh, distal weakness in the lower limb in the form of uh, 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 difficulty in what was the lower limb weakness he became completely bed bound you told no bound. he became bed bound so it is a uh, non length dependent sensory dominant uh, short axonal neuropathy of the upper limb and radicular neuropathy of the lower limb apparently onset to peak is two weeks respiration was not involved and autonomic features were not there in the history like alteration in tears sweating bladder bowel symptoms were not there so i uh, in this young person even though he is exposed to drugs and toxins acute onset paralysis in the absence of an acute overdose poisoning all his occupational conditions become red herrings probably they are not the culprits it may be a uh, jogrens like condition which can present with acute radicular neuropathy is a non length dependent neuropathy one possibility mean mediated other kinds of vasculitis i will uh, consider as the possibility because sensory is very dominant in this case uh, it is um, not the classical type of aidps uh, aidps can have a descending pattern but they are motor dominant so aidp you have got a ascending type you have got the descending type the descending type has got the worst prognosis because it can involve the cranial bulbar and respiratory muscles but it will be motor dominant and proximal more than distal so i will not consider the descending type of aidp even though the duration is okay because it was sensory onset so uh, at this uh, then uh, for the small boys you can tell what is paresthesia you want to use tingling paresthesia was there na Paresthesia indicates uh, either two possibilities: irritative disease of the small fiber, or destructive disease of the large fiber. Um, because the pain uh, pathway is such that uh, the small fibers are inhibited by the large uh, myelinated tracts, and uh, so whenever there is uh, destruction there, there is all the inputs that are there at the periphery is transmitted to the central nervous system, thereby causing paresthesia. So tingling is a positive symptom. Yes, tingling is a positive uh, symptom that can probably indicate a sm uh, small fiber enlargement and mostly a irritative disease. Whereas a negative symptom of a numbness will be either a large fiber uh, involvement or uh, in the peripheral nerve, or it can also indicate uh, uh, the column posterior column uh, where it usually, but it may not be symmetrical uh, like where in the nerve pattern where it is uh, usually a symmetrical at onset. and predominantly distal it may not be exactly like that uh, so that is uh, so if, uh, for everybody sake as we have told started as sensory non length dependent suggestive of a neuropathy 
and lower limb it is radicular neuropathy uh, has positive symptoms as she said positive symptoms indicate modulatory failure between the small fiber and the large fiber second important point for the small boys and girls positive features never occurred in inherited neuropathy so at the end of your uh, history you know it is an acquired sensory motor non length dependent radicular neuropathy so if you put the 3 6 time cutting temporal profile onset to peak is acute it is only 2 weeks onset to peak is acute um, sensory motor or sense pa pattern pattern is sensory motor radicular neuropathy so what could be the cause the three questions you will ask is the temporal profile what is the pick up what are the structures picked up and what are all the treatment options so we think it's an acquired condition because positive symptoms are there rapid progression he was very well preserved person before so treatment option is there so it looks like a treatable condition among the three questions uh, you think of a uh, acute condition so uh, we will consider this as a treatable condition i am thinking first possibility i will put jograms even though descending aadp will be the differential diagnosis because the peak time itself is fitting with the duration of progression of aadp so we will tell that distal sensory onset you see even if you have proprioceptive sensory symptoms distally and the proximal motor is okay there is a sensory variant of guillain barre like that one condition is there but those are all exception rather than examples so sensory onset more suggestive of a small fiber in the upper limb uh, with the positive uh, features uh, predominantly then showing a radicular neuropathy pattern descending aadp appears less likely and when it descended it did not involve the cranial nerves it did not involve the bulbar muscles or respiratory muscles instead it went down to the lower limb so i will put the descending aadp as a second differential diagnosis atypical so a typical type of descending aadp you can put if your examiner asks why a typical you can tell probably small sensory fibers upper limb and uh, yeah, skip the structures in between the descending uh, type is considered bad because of when it descends it involves the bulbar facial respiratory and then comes the lower limb for that reason we call the descending guillain barre bad but it did not pick up any of the so uh, because of the sensory onset and skip uh, lesions in between skipping uh, areas in between it is less likely to be an aadp variant so these are the two possibilities occurred so you put the three uh, six questions first possibility i will still consider a vasculitic condition jogren like so next you said that uh, for two months he remained static so it reached the peak it became plateau spontaneous recovery or recovery with ayurvedic medication we are not knowing the role of uh, it's not definitely nutritional so neurobion would not have helped so he was given vitamins it would not help but whether he was given any natural steroids we don't know because many medicines uh, used have naturally occurring steroids whether they were used in the ayurvedic that helped in the recovery part we we cannot say no but it recovered either it is spontaneous recovery or treatment related recovery so it is a short duration non length dependent acquired sensory radicular neuropathy which had a remission and recovery so recovering neuropathy is one vasculitis immune mediated neuropathy exposure to toxins drugs these are the neuropathies which ex, uh, recover so this comes under the recovering of which we have considered by the pattern the possibility of jogren so nothing is against the diagnosis of a vasculitic neuropathy at this point of time his recovery may be related to the natural steroids or it may be spontaneous recovery immune mediated neuropathies vasculitic neuropathies can spontaneously recover when the immune dysregulation gets spontaneously corrected at one point of time they may recover they may again relapse and this immune dysregulation can have a relapsing remitting course based on triggers 
immune dysregulation can be triggered by systemic infection or uh, dehydration electrolyte imbalance starvation so many factors can uh, are exposed to vaccines they can trigger immune dysregulation in a vulnerable patient so it can remit and relax so that is the first uh, episode he recovered very well and had a long remission so the next next it relapsed that is also not against the possibility of the condition we are considering but in when it relapsed was it having the same pattern or or was there any difference in the pattern that is the second question you are asking the relapse also happened in the upper limb relapse uh, went on to the lower limb relapse also did not involve the cranial nerves that also did not involve the autonomic nerves so all these features are exactly similar but only one feature you said is uh, abnormal patient notice twitching of muscles twitching of muscles in the chin and um, tanga where did you say twitching, twitching of muscles were seen in which chart for chin, chin and face chin and face so that is a motor positive sign of the motor system we had positive features of the sensory system already now we are getting positive features of the motor system so what are all the positive features we can get in a motor system and how is it going to help us in the diagnosis uh, that is what we have to consider now so could you tell me ma you have fasciculations you have got fibrillation you have got myokinia you can have rippling you know cramps contractures so so many positive features can happen and each one might help us in pointing some diagnosis so fibrillation you know uh, is a uh, i am telling this for the small uh, colleagues who may be there in this group so fibrillation this is a commonest positive motor symptoms that is denervation super sensitivity of a single muscle fiber to the chemical environment so fibrillation is seen only in the tongue other area single muscle fiber twitching we will not be able to see so fibrillation is an electrical phenomena generally but for the examiner fibrillation is visible only in the tongue when a single muscle fiber is there and it is having a neuromuscular connection when there is disconnection of the neuromuscular junction with the muscle fiber what happens the acetylcholine that is released from the nerve ending spreads across the surface instead of going on to the you know, synapses normally when the acetylcholine is released it will go to the synaptic cleft and the postsynaptic receptor whereas in this context because of the disconnection the acetylcholine is diffusely spreading on the muscle fiber and the muscle fiber becomes jittery so fibrillation is spontaneous contraction of a single muscle fiber due to denervation super sensitivity to the chemical environment this is electrical event visible only in the tongue so that is fibrillation so chin you are seeing very unlikely to be fibrillation chin fibrillation you cannot uh, see uh, next uh, fasciculation fasciculation is a spontaneous contraction of a motor unit mm-hmm. motor unit means several muscle fibers one motor unit supplies several muscle fibers so they all twitch it will be visible because several muscle fibers are going to twitch it will be visible it will be both subjective and objective based on uh, several i uh, see we tell that uh, subjective is very common they are benign fasciculations whereas objective is usually pointed out by one of the doctors then the patient becomes sensitive motor neuron disease such conditions initially they may not know somebody is going and asking somebody is pointing then they become uh, uh, aware of that and associated muscle wasting muscle weakness reflex change all this is always uh, pathological physiologically subjective more patient goes on complaining i am twitching here i am twitching here it is focused in one place there is no muscle wasting there is no reflex change electrophysiologically it will be larger clusters of 4 to 8 whereas pathological fasciculations are initially at least 
only objective and subjective comes later. The muscle may be wasted, reflex change may be there. Electrically, there are smaller clusters and EMG will show myopathic or denervation pattern. Whereas in the benign fasciculation, only the larger clusters, other EMG will be normal. Other EMG parameters will be normal. So that is pathological. So how do you define fasciculation is a haptic conduction in the terminal axon. So motor unit is there. That unit is supplying several muscle fibers. You have got anterograde and retrograde axoplasmic flow. From the cell body, nutrition is coming to the motor unit. And the motor unit is sending back different impulses. That is called retrograde axoplasmic flow. So they are mutually communicating with each other. Okay, I got this much nutrition today, that is enough. But here what happens is, when there is a retrograde impulse transmission. Are you order cut? I am audible? Not audible. Not audible? Not audible, madam. We are able to hear. Okay. So when it reaches the terminal axon, because of the disease of the cell body, the terminal axon is unable to connect with the cell body. It is a dying back. Cell body is sick and the nerve dies back from distal part. So when there is a retrograde axoplasmic flow, suddenly it finds that because of the dying back, it cannot go back. So the electrical impulse which went back comes back through the same route and puts the motor in it into activity. That is fasciculation. Next, what is myokinia? Myokinia happens in acute denervation. Most of these conditions we are asking are myokinia. Acute, it's a rapidly progressive condition. So it's a multiple motor units firing together, putting a, a muscle into a vermiform movement. So myokinia is a vermiform movement due to uh, continuous activation of multiple motor units. It happens in acute denervation. Sometimes it happens in metabolic conditions. Then there is something called uh, cramps, contractures, and rippling. What is a cramp? Cramp is a painful shortening of a muscle fiber due to energy deprived state. So this can be physiological also. Unaccustomed exertion in a normal person or accustomed exertion in an abnormal or a sick person this will be electrically active. That's a cramp. Many senior people, because of the microvascular ischemia, or diabetic status and all those things, they will have cramps. So cramp can be, cramp is energy deprived state due to accustomed exertion in an abnormal situation or unaccustomed exertion in a normal situation. What is a contracture is always abnormal. It is a metabolic muscle disease. It is a painful shortening occurring during rest or activity, which is accustomed. And this is electrically silent, occurs in various metabolic muscle diseases. The next, what is a rippling? Rippling muscle, cavialonopathy, some muscle diseases we call rippling. So rippling is a uh, continuous vermiform activity precipitated by minor stretch. You know, it will not be there at rest, it will not be spontaneous. You put the muscle to minor stretch. It is typically described in conditions called cavialonopathies. So now we are having a patient who had a typical non-length dependent sensory motor neuropathy with a radicular neuropathy from which the patient spontaneously improved. He had a long period of remission and then he recovered. Now he is getting positive motor features. It may be a fasciculation or it may be a myokinia. Rapidly progressive neuropathies, we are expecting myokinias. Hmm? So this group of, uh, this type of presentation of a peripheral nerve disease is called peripheral nerve hyperexcitability syndromes. I am sure you might have heard of this term. This is a peripheral neuropathy with hyperexcitability. So motor hyperexcitability. So this, uh, this you will categorize as a group of disorder, which can be put under the group of peripheral nerve hyperexcitability syndrome. Because there is a definite peripheral neuropathy, it is not an anterior consul disease. It started with sensory, so you will not think of anterior consul as the culprit. It is not at all so. It is definitely a peripheral neuropathy 
and peripheral neuropathy is remitting, relapsing. Sensory more than motor in, to start with. Later in the lower limb, radicular neuropathy is there. That part is very, very clear. Now we are getting a motor hyperexcitability. So what are the clues you get from this? So um, motor hyperexcitability, electrically you can, you might demonstrate coupled discharges. They are, uh, you see, you can get uh, fasciculations in the neuropathic areas. So in the areas which are affected by the radicular neuropathy, like the thigh muscles or in the lower limb muscles, where definite evidence for a neuropathy is there, you might find fasciculation because fasciculation is not specific for anterior consul disease. It can happen in radiculopathies, it can happen in neuropathies, only thing the distribution will decide. Anterior consul disease, it will be there widespread in the clinically asymptomatic area, paraspinal areas where upper motor neuron is involved also, you might find fasciculation. That is motor neuron disease. Whereas radiculopathy, in the radicular distribution, you can find fasciculation. But you are finding that in the chin, which is a very, very unusual location. So I will categorize this patient as a peripheral neuropathy with the hyperexcitability syndrome. Under this, you have got a group of disorders. I am sure you know all those group of disorders. One is Isaac syndrome. You might have heard of Isaac syndrome. Stiff person syndrome is there, that is different. That's also hyperexcitability syndrome, but in the stiff person syndrome, patient will be stiff, not fly. It is due to involvement of the upper motor neuron. Whereas Isaac syndrome is an element syndrome. They will have neuropathy with the evidence of hyperexcitability, not in the site of the neuropathy. It can be anywhere. So, uh, so it can be uh, myokinia, it can be fasciculation, it can be uh, uh, visible uh, contraction of uh, several groups of muscles in the presence of an element syndrome. You know that this will not be abolished in sleep. It will not be abolished by general anesthesia, but it will be abolished by nerve block because it comes from the peripheral one. So this, now we know it's a remitting relapsing syndrome, which can be categorized under a peripheral neuropathy with the hyperexcitability syndrome. Under this, you have got a group of disorders. One is the Isaac syndrome. That is immune mediated. Second, you have got a uh, voltage gated calcium channel uh, uh, syndrome. We call it as Marwan's disease. So VGKC can present in the uh, upper motor neuron as an autoimmune encephalitis. And in the lower motor as a peripheral neuropathy with hyperexcitability. When it is peripheral neuropathy with hyperexcitability, it is called Marwan's syndrome. And you can have uh, peripheral neuropathy with neuromyotonias. So under peripheral, so now we are little more wiser with the relapse and additional positive features coming. We will categorize our boy as a case of peripheral neuropathy with hyperexcitability. Under this, what is the classification? You have got a, so peripheral neuropathy with hyperexcitability syndromes are classified as inherited, that is genetic, to Immunological, third, idiopathy. Idiopathic is you are thinking it may be immunological or cryptogenic, some cause is there. But with a known antibody profile, you are not able to demonstrate that. So three categories are there under this. One is the inherited neuropathy with neuromyotonias. Some kind of genetic subtypes of hereditary motor sensory neuropathies. At one point, they develop all these positive features. So under that, you can the inherited variety. The acute is common is Isaac syndrome. Second is the VGKC associated Marwan syndrome. And immunological neuropathy is otherwise non-specified, we call it as. Third group, the classical VGKC, classical IG, Isaac, VGKC is the Marwan syndrome. And you've got the Isaac syndrome. And you've got immune mediated neuropathy with hyperexcitability, otherwise unspecified, we call it. So with short duration, onset to peak, remit relapse, all those things are suggestive and you get hyperexcitability, you look for VGKC, you look for other channel of this, you are not finding anything. So you call it as a otherwise unspecific. Then you have got a electrical neuro, neuromyotonia, 
with the peripheral neuropathy that comes under the idiopathic variety. So three categories. So now our patient, we are a little more higher in the diagnosis with the second episode. So we will categorize our patient as a case of peripheral neuropathy hyperexcitability syndrome. It is not at all genetic, very clear, short duration, onset to peak is very short and it is recovering. So it is not at all genetic. So it's an acquired one. So uh, is it a cryptopathy? Cryptogenic or an idiopathic is the question. Uh, so it comes under uh, peripheral neuropathy with hyperexcitability syndrome. So that we will uh, confirm. We will do the uh, VGKC uh, and uh, you can do the electrophysiology to know whether there is a couple discharges and uh, there is a. Uh, so it's an acute. Uh, peripheral neuropathy with hyperexcitability and the differential diagnosis, all the three only, only three are there under that category, acetyl inherited one, immunological one, and cryptogenic. So whether it is immunological or cryptogenic, investigations will show us. So this is uh, that, uh, so it's a, again a good case of peripheral neuropathy with one atypical feature which makes us look at the case from a different angle, it is treatable condition only. So then you go to examination. So that becomes the possibility. Acute, acute sensory motor, non-length dependent radicular neuropathy are uh, treatable, very good. And because during the second episode, my patient showed motor hyperexcitability, which is not in the location of the, the obvious peripheral neuropathy. It comes under the category of peripheral neuropathy with hyperexcitability spectrum. That's a different entity, different entity of peripheral neuropathy. Under that, you have got Isaac syndrome and Marwan syndrome. And you have got idiop uh, un, uh, cryptogenic where you are not able to demonstrate the antibody. So Marwan, when you show the VGKC, Isaac, when you are demonstrate the channel of these, and antibody not demonstrable is cryptogenic. So it will come under this category. Now, so now we will do the investigation. I will still uh, investigate for Jogra nodes. Hmm? Okay. Then uh, you tell in examination. Examination, young gentleman, conscious cooperative, well in time, place, and person. BP was 120 by 70 millimeters of mercury in both uh, supine and its standing, it was 110 by 70 with no orthostatic change. Pulse rate was 87 beats per minute, regular with peripheral pulses being equal and well felt. Saturation was normal with no neck uh, weakness. A neck length ratio was preserved. Um, head to toe examination, there was no pescavus, no no thickenings, no uh, skin pigmentations or teeth pigmentation. Hairs were normal, tongue, there was fasciculations that were seen. Um, I'll show that video later. That end, they've taken that video of the tongue. Um, ton tonsils are not hair, skin, nails, tongue, teeth, and tonsils all were normal. Um, urine also, history wise, and uh, examination also, urine uh, color was normal. Uh, there was no uh, reddish urine. Higher mental functions were normal. Language was normal. Cranial nerves, uh, it was normal, in, uh, but uh, visual fields through. Uh, uh, clinically was normal. Uh, they done some perimetry using the machine. There was mild restriction in I think temporal field. I think they said mild restriction is there. That uh, report I couldn't get. But uh, otherwise everything was normal. So peripheral field restriction, what conditions you get? Um, because it needs patient cooperation. So poor cooperation also possible. Otherwise, what are all the types of in a person with a nerve disease? You see, you can have optic nerve involvement, right. you can have retina involvement, you can have vasculitis involvement. So in all these things, what are all the patterns of field you will get? Supposing you've got an optic neuritis, you get a central scotoma or a centrosecal scotoma. So if it is an acute optic nerve uh, getting affected in the disease process, you will not expect a peripheral constriction you will expect a central scotoma or a centrosecal scotoma. Second, supposing you are finding a vasculitis, you are thinking of a jogran as a possibility. 
strongly we consider Jogren as a possibility. So if it is vasculitis, you get a uniocular quadrantic field effect. Because the central retinal artery is coming, it is dividing into the upper division, lower division, temporal nasal. So one of these branches can get occluded, resulting in a uniocular quadrantic, or it can be an altitudinal hemianopia uh, in one eye, or you can get a uh, sector-shaped field effects. Uh, you can get, and when you look at the fundus, you might find amputated vessels, ghost vessels, corkscrew vessels, or new vessels. So vasculitis produce amputated vessels due to acute ob obstruction of one vessel, or old obstructed vessels become uh, completely yes. destroyed and they become white cord like they are called ghost vessels. So you might find amputated vessels, ghost vessels, or these uh, in uh, abnormal arteries become curled. They are called corkscrew vessels. Then you might find the peripapillary hemorrhages, and you might find uh, uh, also new vessels, new vascularization. One vessel is getting uploaded, and there is a proliferation of a leash of vessels. So vasculitic fundus can have quadrantic altitudinal uniocular defect with uh, typical fundus changes of uh, pale disc, which may be quadrantic, amputated vessels, corkscrew vessels, new vessels, peripapillary hemorrhages. So, and you might also find a cherry red spot if the whole central retinal artery is occluded. Or if it is a posterior ciliary artery, you get a maculopathy. So, these are the features you find in vasculitis. So, you get a peripheral constriction of the field of vision in papilledema. So, what neuropathy you get papilledema? So, if it is a real peripheral constriction, Poem syndrome. Papilledema is seen in Poem syndrome, or you might find papilledema and other paraproteinemias. Because of the paraproteinemia, the whole secretions are CSF, everything becomes viscous. So you get the papilledema in peripheral neuropathy if it is paraprotein associated or Poem syndrome. So papilledema can produce peripheral constriction of the field. Second, uh, RP, retinitis pigmentosa. But supposing you have an acquired chorioretinitis, secondary to vasculitis, choroiditis, chorioretinitis can happen in vasculitis. There you will not get a peripheral construction. Instead, you will get a color desaturation, early color desaturation. Retinal uh, degeneration in a patchy pattern happens in acquired choroiditis, chorioretinitis. There you get a color desaturation, not a peripheral construction. Typical peripheral constriction happens in the degenerative variety of RP, which will at one point lead to tubular vision. Or post-papilledemic situations or acute papilledema or post-papilledemic. Then sometimes we tell that frontal lobe tumors. What happens in frontal lobe? Your attention cannot be having a larger field. So your attention becomes very narrow. So you attend only to one at a time. Or supposing you have got an eye movement problem, patients with the PSP syndromes, progressive supranuclear palsy, or patients have ophthalmoplegia due to various causes, they cannot move, uh, they cannot have a broader field because they have a fixed eye balls. The microsaccades, macrosaccades, and synthesis of the eye movement, which happens very finely in getting us the vision that we have. So in this patient, we have to be sure maybe the patient is not focusing on the peripheral field or you should look for papilledema if the peripheral constriction is true. Does he have any color blindness? Does he have night blindness? Does he have features of RP? Those things. Then does he have any eye movement abnormality? None of those things are there, such as a narrow, uh, mild peripheral constriction. I will consider it as a soft sign it may not have much relevance. But you have to look at the fundus, is there any papilledema? Then you will have to look for point syndrome or paraproteinemias. Sometimes you have got a paraneoplastic paraproteinemias. I'm sure you know that paraproteinemias can be um, myeloma like protein secreting tumors. So in those situations, you can have uh, peripheral constriction due to uh, papilledema. That part of it you should uh, keep in our mind. We may be dealing with the 
very very rare presentation of a peripheral neuropathy with hyperexcitability due to a paraproteinemia resulting in paraproteinemia and peripheral constriction. You may have a case. I have not seen a case like that. I have seen points, but uh, because you said peripheral field constriction, quickly as a postgraduate student, ask all these questions. Look at the fundus. If you don't find anything, uh, when you examine, you can look at the ESR and it will give us some clues. Next one. Fundus uh, was normal. Okay. No papillary demand, no RP changes. Any peripheral field constriction. Naturally, any patient with a peripheral neuropathy, what are all the fundus changes we expect? So you have got nutritional neuropathies, toxic neuropathies, you will get optic neuropathy and eighth nerve. Second nerve and the eighth nerve gets involved in nutritional, toxic, mitochondrial, vasculitis. So nutrition, toxic, mitochondrial, vasculitic disorders prefer the high energy demand nerves. That is the second nerve and the uh, eighth nerve. So whether it is involved, then vasculitis, as I told, the classical features. And then you can have papilledema or you have demyelinating neuropathy, central scotoma, central sequel scotoma. Okay, next one. And then now that there is a tongue fasciculation that is seen. Hmm. Um, but uh, there is no atrophy that we noticed. Uh, it looks like mild atrophy because the grooves are increased in the tongue. Okay. I have seen this kind of uh, tongue in one patient uh, who is a doctor following this uh, Sputnik vaccine. Okay. Uh, because he uh, traveled from some other country to India. And he had taken that vaccine because he had this uh, tongue fasciculations and he was diagnosed as motor neuron disease. Uh, but uh, the clue was, I'm very happy I am writing up that case. The clue was um, he had a vague sensory features in the trunk. And when I examined up for subtle signs, uh, myelopathy like abdominal reflex was absent some uh, patchy patchy sensory loss, proprioception was impaired. And um, it was very interesting. He went into a second, uh, another kind of immune dysregulation, cyclical. Uh, so vaccine received 15th day, he developed all this. In a premier center only, he was labeled MND. He was completely shattered. Maybe the detailed history was not taken or he did not give, I don't know. The soft sensory features where you have to look very carefully, then only you'll get it. Patients say something like here, there, you can leave it off as soft sign. And uh, during, uh, then I put him on steroid. I thought it is a vaccine triggered syndrome. And uh, so he might improve and I put him on methyl methylcuslo. He improved and he went into remission. Then he developed a uh, severe um, ulcerative colitis. So I have picked up some cases after the vaccines they have a remitting relapse instead of doing another vaccine. So whether an immune dysregulation of relapsing nature can be triggered by some of these vaccines, we don't know. What exactly it does to the immune system, we don't know. So I have gathered two, three people like that. With so this is a typical picture I have with me. That's a doctor. Okay. So it is atrophy definitely with the fibrillation. Agreed. Then clawing is there. Clawing is there. Uh, in upper limb, there is hypotonia with uh, clawing in uh, all four. This one with wasting that is seen, both thinner, hypothenar. Hmm. With uh, uh, weakness of the ulnar as well as median nerves. Hmm. The intrashe. All, all, uh, all the fingers are involved. Complete yes, clawing. Madam. Oh, complete clawing that is seen. Um, the power that was there, uh, approximately it was 4 by 5 in both the upper limbs and upper limb at the shoulder. Uh, elbow, uh, one doubt is, should I mention individual muscles when I'm mentioning or is it okay if we tell oh, at no, the level? If you are thinking of a muscle disease, you have to tell individual muscles. Otherwise, if you are uh, thinking of a nerve disease, nerve you disease. have to look for a mononeuritis because even though this case is very different, I have seen Hansen's being missed. Hansen's is not uncommon in some parts of our country still. 
but we are not at all oriented to that. Hansen's being missed and diagnosed various neuropathies and they are given steroid and it flares up. I have seen, I have seen many cases and you don't remove the shirt and look for a patch, even the patch may be there. So that part of it is there, Hansen's uh, is not totally out of the world or out of India. So it is better that you look for a differential power involvement between the median nerve, all nerve and radial nerve. If the involvement is differential, it will help us to still save some mononeuritis. And you have got even the um, demyelinating neuropathies of multifocal hematic sound like they will have, Yes. So those things are also there. It's not always Hansen. Other uh, acute, uh, acute demyelinations can be uh, mononeuritic pattern. So that pattern is there means you can look for power in that nerve pattern. Otherwise, individual muscle examination is not needed. Can we consider a distillal since it was upper limb onset? Can we consider that multifocal motor neuropathy with conduction blocks? But sensory, no? Hmm. Pure but, motor. No. Sensory will not be there. Here it started sensory, no? Yes. Um. Yeah, at the level of wrist, there was uh, 3 by 5 power. Approximately, it was 4 by 5. At level of wrist, it was 3 by 5. With the hand grip being we, uh, with the hand grip and uh, all small muscles of the muscle, uh, small muscles of the hand, all were weak. At hip joint, it was uh, 4 by 5. Flexion, extension, abduction, adduction. Uh, Phil, external and internal rotation was 3 by 5. Uh, this mm -hmm. was not able to fully explain like, why maybe preferentially one was involved. Was it preferential or oh, rotation movement is not a common movement we do. When all other movements are slightly weak, whether he had a difficulty in carrying it, so we don't know. Okay. At this point, what is the internal rotator? What is the external rotator? Name the internal rotators and the external rotators as an exercise. Mm -hmm. Name the internal rotator muscles and mm, external rotators. Internal rotators is gluteus medius and minimus. Yeah. And external rotator is gluteus media maximus with the yeah, internus, gummulus superior, gummulus inferior, and quadratus femoris. So this, uh, if you tell like this, that uh, this power, immediately the examiner will ask this question. So external rotator is gluteus maximus with the obturator internus. Uh, gummulus superior, gummulus inferior, quadratus, femoris. And uh, internal rotator is gluteus medius and medius. Because the other functions of the gluteus maximus and gluteus uh, no. medius and minimus is showing good power. No. No, that is why I am thinking that this rotatory power loss may not be true. It may be because the pain, it's not a usual movement that we do. Patient may not be putting the full effort. Because you know the gluteus medius and minimus are abductors. Abduction is good. And uh, gluteus maximus is a hip extensor. That is also good. In that case, it is likely that the effort put by the patient was suboptimal. Went at uh, knee, ankle, and toe were all normal. Mm. Uh, reflexes, all uh, biceps, triceps, supinator, knee, and ankle were absent. Uh, abdominal, superficial, and deep abdominal, both were, uh, they were actually lost here. Mm. What to mention. They were lost. Condent, corneal conjunctival was present. Plantar was uh, flexor. Uh, coordination was normal. Sensory system, there was graded sensory loss of involving both small and uh, both spironothalamic sensation and postural column sensations. Mm -hmm. Maximum in the uh, uh, upper limb was more than the lower limb. 50% involvement at the upper limb. In the uh, palms and gradually up to the elbow, it was involved. That was 20% and 10% here, approximately. Uh, in, the, uh, in the lower limb also it was similar, but lower limb it was lesser. It was only 30% in the distally and it was 10% approximately. So still it is uh, showing the same axonal, pattern. Axonal pattern. Mm. Both uh, uh, 
Spanathalamic and posterior column both. Vibration was lost. No? Fine touch and proprioception was preserved. Mm. Uh, cerebellum was uh, normal. Gait was normal. Skull, spine and carotids was normal. Uh, while examining mildly, I felt there was uh, 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 in the lower limb, um, extension, uh, dorsiflexion was mildly reduced uh, compared to the other movements. Preferentially, I felt dorsiflexion was be a little weaker compared to other movements. But the eversion was normal, inversion was normal, plant, uh, plantar flexion was also normal. Okay. Uh, Always it is like that. Dorsiflexors have a... Uh, more, it to be more weak, always. Uh, yeah, I'm sure you will, here after you examine any peripheral neuropathy, you'll find dorsiflexion is more and more weaker than the plantar flexion. It has got a preferential tendency to be weak. That is the explanation why it happens, a preferential Is there, is there any reason, madam? Like, I was thinking, is there some no food drop or not, but we couldn't make out. I'm sure in all peripheral neuropathies have food drop. It's the, they don't have a slap. Slap. No, uh, even though it is a distal symmetrical mixed neuropathy, they have a drop rather than a slam. So it is said that it is a preferential vulnerability of the dorsifluxus to fail earlier than the plantar fluxus. That's a convenient use of the English language when you do not have a real scientific explanation. Um, other systems were normal. The cardiovascular, respiratory, and abdominal system was exact, were normal. Um, well, when investigating, uh, one was a uh, um, few points that are odd in this case was the upper motor neuron features. No, no there is no upper motor neuron features. No stiffness of limb. No uh, in, in, uh, increased DTRs. Uh, nothing like that they could find. Because when you have a fibrillating tongue, uh, people will ask. You have got uh, syringomyelia, syringobulbia, mm -hmm. uh, high cervical cord compression, central bulbar syndrome of digerine. No? So all those things can mimic, but of course it is a very clearly peripheral nerve is involved. But when there is a fibrillating tongue, foramen magnum tumors, no? so all these conditions become differential diagnosis. Uh, if you have not demonstrated the severe wasting, clawing and all those things. So posterior column loss and myelopathy will be ventral bulbar syndrome. Mm -hmm. And foramen magnum tumors can produce upper limb onset. You see, you get the, it's called Z pattern. Z so one upper limb, opposite upper limb, then contralateral lower limb and ipsilateral lower limb. That's called Z pattern. Foramen magnum tumors start in the upper limb because they are encircling, plexiform neurofibromas, lipomas. They encircle and pick up. So it's called Z pattern. So whether it's a foramen magnum lipoma, neurofibroma showing the Z pattern, it's not the Z pattern. The Z pattern is proximal, but upper limb, upper limb element, not like this case. So just for the theory sake, I am telling. So the foramen magnum tumor, syringobulbia, uh, those become the differential diagnosis. Anybody seeing such a fibrillating tongue will be frightened. Would like to consider dual pathology or uh, other uh, coexisting second condition is there or not. But I feel it is also a very short duration. Onset to peak, definitely there was a remission. I'm sure it comes under the peripheral neuropathy with hyperexcitability syndrome. So uh, potassium channelopathies are there, GAD antibody, VGKC antibody, Jogren workup, complete musculatic workup you should do, and electrophysiology you should look for neuromyotonic discharges. Apart from the nerve conduction, whether there are neuromyotonic discharges, I feel that this is a, a reversible condition. No? So you will diagnose it as a peripheral neuropathy with motor hyperexcitability spectrum. Agree. But you have nice, nice cases. No? I should appreciate you all. Uh, rare conditions, uh, uncommon conditions. Uh, I think I have myself seen Marwan syndrome one case, Isaac syndrome two cases or three cases, maybe long back. So, and I have seen an inherited HMSN with uh, neuromyotonia. So, peripheral neuropathy with hyperexcitability spectrum is there, but it is very, very uncommon. And this will come under the immune mediated 
peripheral neuropathy, hyperexcitability syndrome, and uh, he will certainly improve. But uh, as an exam going student, when there is a fibrillating tongue, prepared for the other differential diagnosis, syringobulbia. Why it is not syringobulbia? Why it is not ventral bulbar syndrome? Why it is not a foramen magnum tumor? So do you like to consider a dual pathology? Dual pathology means acute anterior horn cell syndrome with peripheral neuropathy is uncommon. So, uh, so whether he had a bulbar polio, <laughs> so acute horn cell, anterior horn cell, acute anterior horn cell, viral diseases. Right. It's only a theoretical possibility. On the background of an ongoing non-length dependent neuronopathy, neuropathy. Or neuropathy, my patient is developing a viral infection resulting in a bulbar polio, which is leaving an atrophic tongue. These are theoretical possibilities. I'm sure it is all together and it is a peripheral neuropathy with motor hyperexcitability spectrum. So today you go and read all these things, Isaac syndrome, Marwan syndrome, inherited uh, neuromyotonias with neuropathies, the idiopathic variety. Then you will feel that uh, good, you saw a very rare case and this person will improve. What is the Investigation yeah. around normal, CBC, ESR was normal. Madam? EMG madam? electromyography. EMG uh, is planned tomorrow, madam, for him. We plan to do it tomorrow. Uh, should, there, uh, uh, that is one. Look for uh, uh, myotonic discharges. You yes, should sir. specifically tell the lab people to look for myotonic discharges. So, waxing and waning in amplitude and frequency. So neuromyotonia is a myotonic, that kind of discharges, complex repetitive discharges, which are waxing and waning in amplitude and frequency. If you find it will completely electrophysiologically also correlate and you will do the immunological workup. So uh, what is the latency they have written the value, sir? Uh, the, uh, so uh, very much latency is uh, both distally and proximally or prolonged. Nerve conduction velocity is very much uh, reduced. And uh, what about amplitude is uh, also reduced, but not that bad. So it is uh, definitely it is showing a uh, neuropathy. Probably it is a demyelinating variety because amplitude is reduced, but not very bad. So velocity is very much reduced. 30, 17 meters per second in the median nerve, 36. 22, that's all very bad, more than 50% reduction in the conduction velocity. The lower limb, you got no CMAP in the pop, uh, popular I mean, nerve. Pop. And tibial nerve is 42, not bad. So again, here again, it is showing the non-length dependent pattern. Lower limb conduction seems better than the upper limb conduction. Mm -hmm. So here you find that there is a significant delay in the conduction velocity. And there is a lower limb better than the upper limb, so in confirming the non-length dependent, we will see the proximal amplitude and the distal amplitude. Let us see. No snap, so sensory is involved. So amplitude, yes, all the snaps are affected. Okay. So sensory do, sensory dominance. So it is correlating with all the clinical features uh, you picked up. Let me see the amplitude proximal and distal. Go back to the previous one. So amplitude. Uh, proximal is this one. Distal amplitude they have not given. If they have given uh, the proximal uh, and the distal amplitude, we can see like, it is there. Uh, amplitude distally is uh, 170 microvolts proximally. So there is some conduction block also. More than 50% reduction in the amplitude will qualify for a 50% uh, suppression. But severe uh, Neuropathy itself can do that, but there is a 50% reduction in the amplitude between the proximal and the distal. Proximal is 60, distal is 170. So between the proximal and distal amplitude reduction is very significant. So it is there in the median nerve, in the wrist, everywhere it is there. You know, in the ulnar nerve, it is not there. So 1 millivolt, 700 millivolt, 140. Varying type of amplitude suppression is there. So uh, variable degree of conduction block is also there. But that is, uh, conduction block is not specific when there is sensory motor. So pure motor neuropathy, you get conduction block, it will qualify for MMM. Here it is not so. Guillain-Barre syndrome also you get 
conduction blocks any demyelinating neuropathy get conduction blocks so severe neuropathy sensory motor non length dependent every parameter is qualified so you will still do the jogrens workup you will do the vgkc and you will do the uh, gad and you will give him immunotherapy if you want you can do nerve biopsy also hmm? It was the MRI, MRI brain and spine was done. That mm -hmm. was all normal. Okay. That was done because of the peripheral field construction. Huh? Yes, madam. Uh, and also, the, uh, yes. And the ANA we had done, the ANA screening we had done, the ANA immunofluorescence was normal. Mm -hmm. uh, profile, paraproteinemia, and uh, other autoimmune workup is yet to come. Madam. It was admitted day before yesterday. Okay. Uh, you can do a nerve biopsy also. No? Yes, ma'am. Because if not, none of them are coming on positive, you will call it as a cryptogenic variety. So, uh, peripheral neuropathy with hyperexcitability part is very clear. And you will do the EMG to look for neuromyotonic discharges. You will do complete immunological workup. If everything is negative, you can still do the nerve biopsy. But without much delay, you should give start him on methyl penicillin. Nothing to lose. Because his tongue is already atrophic. Yes, no. You should start him on methyl penicillin after yes, taking the blood for the uh, test. You can just take the blood, let the result come slowly. No? Okay, so you yes, saw another spectrum in peripheral neuropathy that is non length dependent neuronopathy with radicular neuropathy with motor hyperexcitability. So good, ma. So good. CSF was done, no? CSF, no, madam. Today we are doing the CSF. Okay. Any questions, Satya? One question is, what is the role of lacosamide in neuropathic pain? It's, it's all symptomatic. No? They are membrane-stabilizing drugs. Carbamazepine, GABA, pendin, lacosamide, all those things can be used, but generally I don't use. I don't use any of these drugs because, um, because neuropathy, you treat it. Symptom treatment, what even Guillain Barry syndrome people will give Tegretol, GABA, pendin. What happens is you know it's a, a disease which is going to recover. You put them on GABA, pendin, and carbamazepine, they are more ataxic and more drowsy. They may develop hyponatremia. You know, hyponatremia is one of the bad prognostic uh, parameter. So generally, I tell them brief paresthesia if possible to tolerate use local applicants and rather than uh, oral drugs. Many people use a huge you know, amount of carb diabetic neuropathy itself, gabapentin, carbamisipin, amitriptyline. So when will you take the disease-modifying disease drug? I will not give all this in child, tell them. It is my personal thing, but depending on the degree of suffering you can give. I hardly use uh, analgesics and uh, all these things in huge doses. It can be used. It reduces, definitely it reduces the symptoms, but better to talk to them, tell them that this is an additional drug which may make you drowsy, have some side effects, fatigue, lethargy, why you want. Like that, I tell them and I don't use. But it can be used. Definitely it can be used. Scientifically, it is used. Any other question? One question, uh, undergraduate student has asked. Uh, can you please explain how to differentiate uh, peripheral neuropathy, radiculopathy, and plexopathy mm -hmm. on the basis of history from okay. undergraduate perspective? You know, there is no undergraduate perspective or postgraduate perspective in neurology. Man. Neurology has got one perspective only, that is patient. No? You see, your question is very good. Thank you for asking that question. As I told, all this, you put three titles, sensory, motor, reflex. So, radiculopathy, plexopathy, neuropathy, you want to differentiate. Let us imagine a neuropathy like this person having upper limb onset, plexopathy and Neuropathy. So radiculopathy, sensory, what will be the sensory? Sensory will have positive or negative. Positive will be shock-like pain. Very common. Somebody puts a weight on the head, he uh, dislocates a disc, you'll have a very shock-like pain. 
which is having precipitating factor in the form of movement of the neck or abnormal posturing of the neck. So it is a sharp pain which travels along the distribution of the affected root. It will have precipitating factor. It will have relieving factor. When you lie down, it might get relieved. And it will have a sensory motor involvement in the radicular fashion. Supposing you say C5, sensory is outer upper, C6, outer forearm, C7, middle finger up to the mid forearm, C8, medial part of the forearm, and D1 is upper part of the medial part of the upper arm. So that is a sensory pattern in the upper limb. So that pattern, depending on whichever root is involved, you will get sensory impact in that root. Motor, if you take C5, is abduction and you will have uh, deltoid, biceps, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, subscapularis. These are the C5. So these muscles may show the weakness. If it is C6, semi-prone flexion. If it is C7, it is triceps, wrist extension, wrist flexion. So it will be C7. If it is C8, D1, small muscles. So sensory, motor, so sensory positive, negative. I told the sharp radicular pain and mot, uh, sensory loss will be in the radicular distribution and motor weakness will be in the distribution of the pattern of each roots which I just enumerated and reflex. Supposing it is biceps is going, biceps jerk will go. So it is C5 root. If C7 root is going, triceps jerk will go. If you see it, D1, it will be finger flexion. So sensory, motor, reflex, we have seen the radicular pattern and any special features. That is the fourth title I put. Suppose you have got a CID1 root and you have a harness syndrome. Then you know it is either a syringomyelia or a uh, tumor coming from the upper part of the lung and infiltrating into the CID1 root. So sensory, motor, reflex, special features for the root I have told. Next you come to the plexus. Plexus will not have pain in the distribution of the roots. It will have pain in the location of the plexus. So plexus pain can look like an angina. Suddenly you may get a chest pain. Or if it is a lumbosacral plexus, you might find appendicitis like pain or diverticulitis like pain. I have seen children evolving plexopathies. They have been diagnosed with appendicitis. Post-surgery patient develops paralysis. Surgeon is blamed. So you did appendicectomy and paralyzed the leg. Actually, it was the paralysis which was starting nothing to do with appendicitis. So we have seen like that. So the pain will be in the location of the plexus. It will be dull, deep aching. And it will radiate along nerves which come from the plexus. So it will not be a root pain, it will be nerve pain. So if it's a brachial plexus, the pain might come along the radial nerve or pain might come along the ulnar nerve. Pain might come along the median nerve. So it is in the location of the plexus and it will radiate along nerves. And usually more than one nerve. Because how to differentiate a mononeuritis from a plexopathy? More than one nerve coming from the plexus. So when there is pain in the location of the plexus, which radiates along the nerves, and the nerves involved are more than one nerve, there is no definite precipitating or relieving factor. That is a plexus pain. Uh, uh, then reflexes, of course, depending on whichever muscles are affected, whether it's absorbs or reflex, the reflex will go. Peripheral neuropathy, just like we discussed, it will be usually length dependent or non length dependent. When it is length dependent, longest, they may be sensory, they are usually mixed. That is sensory motor autonomy. Most of the neuropathies are mixed. Diabetic neuropathy, the commonest neuropathy, they will have dry skin, they will have sensory impairment, they will have grip weakness. So distal symmetrical mixed pattern with a burning paresthesia, which is in the nerve distribution. <coughs> no root pains, no plexus pain. That is peripheral neuropathy. Is it clear, ma'am? Any other question? <coughs> uh, one question was there, Madam.
Today, postgraduates read about peripheral neuropathy with the motor excitability syndromes. That's a spectrum of peripheral neuropathy, rare spectrum. You can read it in your Harrison itself. Uh, one person has asked, uh, if there is any contraindication for phenytoin in hypotensive patient. Phenytoin in hypotensive patient. Phenytoin for what purpose, ma? You see, phenytoin can, supposing you have an MI patient, you know that phenytoin can produce cardiac arrhythmias. So whether he is a uh, hypotension is due to MI. So why aren't he has seizures also? Is that the question? So phenytoin for what indication you are asking? Phenytoin is not so good in patients with peripheral neuropathy because itself, it itself can produce peripheral neuropathy. And uh, it itself, when there is a hypotension due to MI, it can produce arrhythmias. So generally we don't use if heptoin is indicated in a patient with the MI, newly detected and he has seizures. So uh, I am sure you know that uh, heptoin is a cheap drug, so we use it. Otherwise, uh, its side effects profile is very high. And you tell me the context in which you are asking, then I can. Hypotension due to what? Autonomic neuropathy. The context did not mention. Uh, yes, um, blood pressure because. alterations yeah. do not happen due to phenytoin, but arrhythmias can happen. Yes, in the context of uh, status epilepticus, is there any context? Hypotension as such is not a contraindication. Yeah, if the hypotension is uh, no, not due to an acute MI. Acute MI is there means it is a contraindication. Any other question? No other questions. Thank you. This is also a very nice case, ma. Thank you, madam. Not a nice case, which as I have told, I think some class long back when I was like you, when I diagnosed uh, intramedullary AVM, uh, I was so excited because that person was being repeatedly treated as transosmyelitis. Those days when MRI enroll is not easy, but when I thoroughly examined, it looked like a syringe, but the presentation is acute. So every time it is acute presentation, he is being treated with some steroids, recovering with partial sequelae, going repeated transosmyelitis. Why it is happening? So when I put in a stethoscope, it was a juvenile avium. There was a brui. So pseudo syringomyelic presentation of a spinal avium. I was so excited and I wrote in the medicine reference paper, very interesting case. So there was one professor of medicine that madam is no more now. Next day, I was blasted for writing interesting case, not appreciated for diagnosing the case. Madam missed so many times. <laughs> so it is like that. You should not tell interesting because we should never use it because somebody is uh, suffering. No? But one good thing is uh, this will be reversible. I am sure. Okay. Any other question? Mom? Other question? Uh, one question, follow-up for that uh, same question of uh, differentiating localization. Mm -hmm. um, Madam, uh, neuropathy will have distal motor weakness, while radiculopathy and plexopathy will have both distal and proximal. No, are... I don't know if it is a C5 root, why you will have distal? Suppose you have C5 root, it supplies the deltoid, biceps, subscapularis, supraspinatus, infrosis. They are all proximal, no? So radiculopathy will produce the muscles which are supplied by the radical that is involved, depending on if it is distal or proximal. And the idiopathic plexopathies are proximal, motor dominant with pain. That is a phenotype. But as I told, infiltrating plexopathies, post-radiation plexopathy, malignancy infiltrating, they will have what I told, location of the plexus and radiate along multiple nerves. Whereas acute plexopathy or clinically motor and symptoms may be pain. That's the way it presents. So it has nothing to do with distal or motor. It is 
to do with what is the nerve or the uh, fluxus that is involved. Any other question, ma? And just uh, out of curiosity, for that intramedullary AVM that you had, mm -hmm. uh, like uh, dural AV fistulas or uh, like AV fistulas in the uh, cord, mm -hmm. like they say if spine, uh, steroids will worsen them after giving steroids. Uh, um, is that AV. true? No, um, this is a inherited uh, arteriovenous malformation. We have got uh, four types, glomus, you have got a juvenile AVM and a, a long dorsal. So here it is a, a juvenile AVM which has got an intramedullary component and an extramedullary component. So when it bleeds, what causes, otherwise it sits there quietly. What causes the paralysis is the expanding hematoma. So you give a steroid thinking it is myelitis, it will have the anti-edema effect. So the patient improves which is sequelae. Again, that AVM is it bleeding. So here are three episodes on the same side. Those days long back when I started my uh, job in Kerala. So that time uh, MRI and all was not there. So immediately you don't do. Every paraplegia is acute transverse myelitis. Unless you thoroughly examine, you will lose it. Why repeated myelitis on the same site? You should look for some other cause. So when I saw, I was surprised. It was a juvenile AM with an intramedullary and an extradural component. Because of that, I got the... It's not like the dural AV fistula, which are commonly acquired and post-traumatic. Yeah. Any other question? No other question. Thank you. This is Thank really you so much. Uh, uh, unusual peripheral neuropathy. Good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.